Lisa, welcome to Wealth Talk. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So Lisa, looking forward to today's conversation because we're going to be talking about supported living and it's an area that's really gained a lot of interest within the Wealth Builders community. I've seen many, many posts over the last six to 12 months from our members. So looking forward to finding out exactly what supported living is. So perhaps why don't we kick off there for anyone who's listening and doesn't fully understand what that term covers? Yeah, it's quite complicated. It's it's simply um, a living arrangement for a tenant who has support needs, really. Um, so so it encompasses a whole ro- load of different needs, and they can be long and enduring kind of lifetime needs. You know, like someone with learning disabilities, long term mental health conditions, autism, physical disabilities. Or there can be quite short term support needs where someone may need a level of support for maybe a few months or a few years Um, and so they kind of fall into those categories but yeah it's simply just a living arrangement for someone who has um, a level of support that they require. Mm. And, and, And did this perhaps have a different name was it referred to as something differently in the past because it feels like supported livings you know it's really come to the forefront recently. It has I think in the past, we used to put people um, with particularly like long term conditions like learning disabilities and mental health. They were kind of placed into institutional care. So people were put into, you know, you go right back to sort of Victorian and pre Victorian times. There were big institutions where people were placed and locked up and put away. And there was very much a move about bringing people out of those institutions and making them part of the community. And by doing that, bringing them into the community where their families are, where they should be as part of the community, they actually need somewhere to live. So they need a a house or a home of their own that they can be part of. And with supported living, it's a little bit different in that their um, their tenancy arrangement and their care arrangement are separate. So if you think about a residential care setting, you, your care and your tenancy are intertwined, aren't they? You can't um, move into a care home, but then say you want your care provided by somebody else. Whereas in a supported living setting, it gives you more flexibility if you've got long term support needs because you can stay in your home and your care can be provided by someone. But actually, if if that care isn't meeting your needs anymore after a few years, you could change that care provider and still stay in your own home. Yeah. And we're going to find out all about supported living gateway today, Lisa. But tell us how you got into this this area yourself. So, so my background's in nursing. I um, worked in busy East London A&E departments, worked my way up to senior sister roles and then did some community nursing work. And we relocated down to Devon and I decided I would follow my other passion, which is property. I've always really enjoyed property, set up a company called Pebble Properties and developed a couple of heritage flats. And I really enjoyed that. And I thought this was me. I was going to do beautiful old buildings because that's what I really loved. And then a chance encounter um, led me to discover supported living. Um, I was asked to um, refurbish a pebble dash ugly bungalow for, it's a a great building, but it's to complete contrast to what I thought I would be doing um, for a young man with really complex and challenging learning disabilities. And I love the process of doing that. I love the process of kind of using my nurse brain. I wasn't phased about being in care team meetings, discussing his needs and working out how to make this property best suit him. But I encountered loads of challenges in doing that first property. I found um, I had lots of problems with getting it refinanced, with getting the right mortgage on it. Every every um, point I kind of came across a hurdle and there was nowhere for me to go with that. I found I got really kind of stuck. If you're looking at other property strategies, there's lots of information out there, isn't there? There's a Facebook group for HMOs, or if you're doing serviced accommodation, there's a course or a book. And there was nothing about supported living that I could find. So I decided to set up a Facebook group just to try and connect with other people who were doing this. Um, And the Facebook group has, I kind of like, I jokingly said, I expected someone to say, oh, Lisa, there's this group over here. Have you not found it yet? And our group's now at 2,300 members of property people who are really interested in supported living. So it kind of all, yeah, it all came about that way, really. Right. And obviously now you're a member of the Supported Living Gateway. So tell us a bit bit more about what that is, Lisa. Well, I, I suppose the evolution of that from my point of view was from that Facebook group. I was being approached by, as I started talking more and more about my experiences of supported living and how great I thought it was as an investment strategy, but also the, the challenges with it. I was being approached by a lot of property people saying, how do I get into this? I love the idea of it. It's great. You know, it's the ultimate win win. It's good business sense. And I can help someone and create a home for someone who may, may struggle to, to um, find a home. But they were, a lot of the property people were struggling to connect with the people who needed property. 
And on the other hand, I was being approached more and more by providers asking me to create properties for them. People who really heartbreaking stories, you know, um, people stuck in hospital who would have been discharged 12 months ago, but couldn't actually leave the hospital because there was nowhere appropriate for them to move to. Or people stuck in unsafe, unsuitable accommodation who couldn't move, who, who no one could find the right home for them. And the care providers were saying, I'm spending all day on the phone. I'm on right move. I'm speaking to letting agents. They their tenant, their landlords don't understand supported living. They don't want to let to us. And it felt like there needed to be a way to bring these two groups together. So I got together with a group of other people who all have been working in supported living in all different ways and have a really diverse background, but we're all property investors and developers. So there's um, Rich Liddell, who runs Blue Oak and has been, his background's in the military, but he's been a long-term property investor and developer. There's Russ Crabtree, whose background is in construction and project management and has done quite a few supported living schemes. There's Mark Bowen and Leah Bowen. Both their backgrounds are in the city, but they're property investors and developers. So kind of between the five of us, we've got this really diverse skill set. And we kind of got together and talked about supported living. And what, what we felt needed to happen was a way to make it easier for people to connect to create more homes for vulnerable people essentially that's what we kind of say we're doing so so the supported living gateway kind of came out of those conversations and us all coming together yeah that's great and um and how how big is this sector how much demand is there you know will there be a point where there's simply you know the the need will be filled yeah i i don't see that at the moment the conversations i'm having with the providers is that because I'm principally liaising with the providers and bringing them on board to the gateway, is that there's a massive demand. I have a huge want list all around the country. Um, and I think that demand is going to grow because I think the move away from residential care settings is still happening. You know, in our heads, um, institutions for people with long term mental health learning disabilities have got long gone, you know, because we all think workhouses have shut. But actually, there's still an awful lot of institutional settings and people being placed maybe the other end of the country away from their family and friends because there's not a suitable accommodation for them near home. So I feel like there is still massive, massive demand for properties. And there's also, you know, like I said, that's the long term conditions. But when you're talking about people who've been street homeless, people who are fleeing domestic abuse, um, teenagers leaving the care system, you know, there's a whole range of different needs um, that where people need accommodation with some support. Mm. So for anyone listening now, Lisa, who perhaps has just been doing standard, you know, buy to let for, you know, for a number of years, and perhaps they're, they're interested in, in making the transition over, what are some of the things they need to consider? Um, you know, how different is it to, to just letting to, to, you know, a standard AST? Um, I think the things to think about, um, the challenges are finance, you know, so you need to, if you have a standard buy to let product on your, you know, mortgage product on your property, that might not be compliant with supported living. So, you know, that you do need to discuss it with your lender um, and have a conversation with them about it. I think that's one of the challenges and makes it a little bit different. And finding the connections, finding um, who needs your property. You might have the perfect property, but how do you actually connect with those providers? And that's what we're hoping to do through the gateway is allow, make it easier for people. It can seem quite complicated and quite daunting, I think, to start with, to try and understand all the layers and complexity in supported living. And so again, through the gateway, what we've tried to do is we've got our members can access a training package, which is just on on the portal and then we have a, a more in-depth training for people who really want to have a deep dive and really sort of understand supported living a bit more because we found that people really did have that desire to, to learn more about it. Mm. And what kind of adaptations uh, might need to happen in terms of the properties to, to be suitable? It really varies on the tenant group so if you're looking at um, tenants who have low levels who have support needs but maybe not physical support needs so if you're thinking about teenagers leaving the care system or people who've been street homeless you may need to do absolutely no adaptation to your property whatsoever you know your standard hmo your standard shared house your standard one bed flat may actually be fine without any adaptation whereas the other end of the spectrum is people who have very complex support needs who might need like the young man that i did the 
first property for might need a completely adapted property. So there's, there's a whole range. And I think people get a bit daunted thinking they would have to do really high level of adaptation. But I would say the majority of property that's required doesn't need to be adapted or maybe need small tweaks like an extra fire door or an extra smoke alarm or an extra a different kind of lock on a door, you know, fairly simple things. When you look at that in the context of the benefits of supported living, where you may have a lease taken on your property for anything from two to 10 to 20 years, and in that time, you're not responsible for any of the voids, any of the damages, any of those sort of landlord headaches, you know, and often the lease will cover things like your gas boiler servicing, your fire alarm servicing. So actually, it becomes a really, really good passive long term strategy, supported living. Once it's set up, it does take a little bit longer to get set up. But once the scheme's set up and established, actually, you can really step back from it most of the time and, and not worry about your property. Mm. And, and does the fact that you get those long guaranteed rents mean that the rental is often lower or, or how does that yeah. compare? Yeah, not necessarily. So I'd say the rent kind of broadly falls into three categories. Sometimes you're offered LHA rates. And I would say don't automatically discount discount those because actually if you look at those in that bigger picture of actually the no voids, the no letting agents fees, the management costs, actually that can pretty soon add up to being similar to market rent when you've taken off your other costs. The majority of the providers we're talking to are offering market rent for their properties really. So they're they're generally looking at offering you about what you would get on the open market for a property. And then obviously, like I said, you've not got your letting agent fees, you've not got your void. So pretty quickly that adds up to being quite an attractive offering. And then sometimes you do get above market rent for properties as well. But I think the majority of the above market rent rates will have to reflect quite a high level of adaptation to the property. They have to be kind of justified why you require that above market rent. You know, it might be that that tenant can't just move out of your property into another two bed property anywhere else it needs that level of adaptation to to meet their needs Mm. and and with 2020 being the year that it's been lisa how how have you seen things change or evolve this year with the the demand i think people have been really interested in supported living i think from a from a provider point of view the demand has been the same i think the only stumbling block has been that some of the commissioners in the local authorities who would maybe commission some of the bigger schemes a, a li- looking a little bit more inward and a bit more COVID focused rather than thinking about actually what do we need as our long term strategy for, you know, do we need a block of 10 flats here? So I think that has affected things a little bit. But I think on the other side, the, the demand has continued the same, particularly for the smaller schemes. And that's only been a few areas we've found that. I think a lot of property investors have been looking at this far more than they maybe would have done previously because suddenly your student lets are a little bit more uncertain, aren't they? Your serviced accommodation perhaps has got more voids, obviously depending where it is in the country. And your, you know, your shiny professionals are maybe not paying the rent in the way that they would have been because their jobs aren't so secure. So I think it's made supported living and other social housing a bit more attractive to people really because I think they're thinking actually there is some, you know, they can see that actually financially it's maybe a bit more secure as well. Yeah. So again, for, for our listeners right now, Lisa, who would you say, you know, really should be thinking about this? Who's the kind of perfect candidate? So in my head, I think every property investor should be looking at supported living. I think it's a really good way to diversify your property portfolio. Um, and I think it's something that that's through the gateway, through the supported living gateway, we're trying to make it accessible to everybody. So In the past, you had to have a really high level of specialist knowledge to get into this space, or you had to have very good connections, or you had to be one of the big players. There's lots of big developers who specialize in supported living, and they're throwing a lot of money at it. Lots of pension schemes, lots of big investment funds see it as very secure income. So our argument at the gateway is if it's good enough for those big players who are throwing millions of pounds at it it's a good secure investment for everyone to be thinking about and obviously it also fits in with SAS pensions as well so supported living properties can with a supported living lease on it is a way to hold a residential property in your SAS so that makes it very accessible for a lot of people with SAS pensions too And, and would care homes on the kind of bigger scale of things they would obviously fall under this as well not really because care homes if you think of what I said about the sort of tenancy in the um, care being separate in supported living and being a more residential property 
care homes tend to be they are what everyone perceives supported living to be but care homes tend to be um residential care settings so they're slightly different way of investing they're different property um models saying that quite a lot of the resident old care homes are coming to us to be converted into flats and there's a lot of demand for small blocks of flats so so Mm. they do kind of come but not in that traditional image of them okay so Tell us a bit more about the Supported Living Gateway and if someone listening wants to kind of connect with you, Lisa, and find out more, how does that work? So the best place to find out more is to go to www.supportedlivinggateway.com. That's all one word. Um, and you can as a go on there as a property investor and you can just register um, and access some of the resources that are there and, and find out a bit more about what we do. The gateway basically is a way as a property investor for you to upload your property and get it seen by hundreds of care providers all around the country who are looking for properties. So it's the easiest way for you to connect with different providers who are looking for property. So you have that, you can upload as many properties as you own or control. So if you have a lease option or a rent to rent agreement on the properties. You also through that can access some of our um, Uh, like I said some of the training that's part of it and again as part of our kind of vision was to make it easier for people to get involved in supported living so we've got access to specialist affiliates like mortgage brokers like insurance brokers architects people who really understand supported living and as part of that membership you get discounts on their services so it kind of is just a way to bring everything to do with supported living into one space so it's kind of like a one-stop shop if you're interested in supported living it's a great place to start yeah no great community great team that you have there lisa so (laughs) thank you so much for sharing today it's been really interesting and great speaking with you great thank you christian